Good afternoon. I'm Rob Bertini, and this is Jennifer Dill. We run this seminar series and uh, want to welcome you. And I want to welcome our speakers, um, particularly because they're both PSU alumni of the Master of Urban and Regional Planning program. So our graduates go on to do great things, and hopefully this presentation will indicate that. And, uh, <laughs> I don't want to hear afterwards if you don't think it did. So today they're going to be talking about looking to TriMet's future, and we'll be discussing uh, some corridor planning and capacity analysis that they've been working on. I cornered them at a recent open house and said you should come and present at one of our seminars. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Alan Leto and Mark Roden from TriMet. It's all yours. Thanks. Uh, what we're going to do is um, give you a real quick, hopefully quick, whirlwind tour of sort of the past, present, and future of TriMet. And then sort of dig di deep into some details on uh, some of the work that we've been doing in our department to look at uh, analyses that really are, are, are needed to support this future work and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and that we're not uh, uh, setting things up that aren't going to work for the future. I'll just mention, um, as Rob said, I'm a former MERP, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning, so if anybody in here is another MERP, Go. <laughs> um, graduated in 1997, spent a few years as a consultant with a small consulting firm that has an office here in town doing mostly transit service planning, largely for small and medium-sized uh, cities, and then moved to TriMet about four and a half years ago and was working on the, the bus side for a while doing capital improvements to, for transit signal priority and other, other priorities to enhance existing bus services, and then moved into rail in the last couple of years. And uh, Mark, I, I think I'll let you talk about yourself when you stand up. Um, Mark is really going to cover the, the second part of this. I'm going to try to talk quickly through the first part because I think it's interesting, but it doesn't get to sort of the real details. So first, how do we get where we are today? Um, some real background for those of you who haven't been in the, the region forever. Um, if you go back far enough, this is a great shot because you can't even tell what you're looking at, but this is downtown years ago back when the air quality was much, much worse than it is today. Regardless of what you think it is today, look back in the 70s and you see this. Had 180 days of air quality viol violations. Obviously, increasing congestion, that's always going to happen as long as you have economic development, but continuing to see problems with that. This is downtown before we had a bus mall. We were running into increasing congestion and having problems with operating. And the central city, if you, you know, look back in the past, was really in decline, along with everybody else's central city across the whole nation, as sort of the disinvestment in downtown and people were running out to the suburbs because they were this great new thing. Um, and really looking at parking lots. This is uh, Pioneer Courthouse Square before it was Pioneer Courthouse Square. And this is a great one. I wish this were coming out better, but what you're seeing is a 1970 plan for expanding freeways and highways in the region. And most of those red lines, if you can see them, were new freeways. And the idea was this great new thing um, that we came up with uh, sort of immediately post-war Freeways everywhere would really enhance uh, transportation and really uh, allow everybody to get all over the place. And it, it really was a little too much. Um, we had something of a good thing, and we went a little too far with it and it really formed a backlash. And around the Mount Hood Freeway, which I hope you've heard about because I'm not going to go into too much detail, after that, in terms of the backlash, there was this governor's task force that was formed to say, okay, we're not quite heading in the right direction. What do we really want to be doing? We started looking at high-capacity transit like rail and, and bus system. Here's the transit mall actually during construction back in 1977 where it's obviously transformed. It looks somewhat like it is today, but you can see the shelters aren't there yet. And if you look really closely, you can see that buses are running two-directional 
on this street, unlike we do today, because we were in the middle of construction at that time. But this was really part of, of reinvesting in downtown and, and bringing things back to the center and trying to make downtown more accessible and make the region work better uh, in a balanced transportation system. And part of downtown, obviously, was changing that parking lot into Pioneer Square, becoming da downtown's living room, Portland's living room. And then skipping over years and years and years of process and discussion and all kinds of, of uh, public discussion and, and political um, understanding to the 2040 growth concept, with, which really tries to help guide where we're going today. And so the TriMet projects that supported that, we already mentioned the bus mall, looking at light rail alignments. East Side Max, of course, from here out to Gresham was first back in the 80s. Created a new focus for downtown and um, really uh, became a spine for Lloyd Center development that, that came along at the same time. And, you know, if you look out in Gresham, when we were first building it, Gresham wasn't that interested in having light rail come into the middle of their town. And now they're sort of kicking themselves and really expanding downtown towards light rail, looking at that as more and more of an amenity over time. The West Side project came next, obviously, combined highway and transit project, uh, 18 miles from Portland, the existing alignment, out to Hillsboro, and really created synergies. We started to have a little bit less of just a line and more a little bit of a system. We did some innovative things just in how we did the project. Uh, integrating into urban streets, the bottom photo is of Goose Hall. The top one is out in Hillsboro. Tr really trying to make it interact with the city and not have it be uh, a barrier down the middle, but have it be part of the, the system. And creating some signature elements for, this is out in Hillsboro, uh, an arch bridgeway across uh, a road. And... Um, in contrast, in, in many ways, to how we did East Side back in the 80s, trying to really learn to work with the community rather than around them. And this is out in Goose Hollow, obviously. Uh, West Side alignment, uh, it wasn't just putting rails out there. We ended up helping to, to uh, support a lot of new development. And the round, as you know, which was on hold for a little while, is now leasing out and doing pretty well. That's out in Beaverton and really changing, starting to change how Beaverton looks. Airport Max, much more recent, 1991, an extension from Gateway out to Portland International Airport with several stations along the way. And really a, an innovative way of doing a project, working with a private developer and working with the port who had some land who, that they didn't need that, looking at redevelopment over time there, um, and using a fast-track design build delivery, which really kind of changed the way we were delivering projects at the same time. And it's an interesting project. If you drove up and down I-205 while we were out there doing this, uh, this is a great example of, of uh, tricky engineering. That bridge, which now crosses I-205, we built that center span, and then they had to build little pieces of the bridge at a time, one side to the other, as it slightly tilted to make sure that everything actually fit together without having to close the freeway at the same time. It's really an amazing project. And I hope you can see this. Uh, this is an aerial of the airport. The left is before. The right is what we hope will be the after. Of course, if you want uh, economic development near an airport, opening right around 9-11 isn't the best time to do it. Um, but we, there, there are starting to be more discussions about what opportunities are out there. And the infrastructure is in place to help guide what the future development is going to be. So with those projects that are already out there and working, Portland really stacks up well compared to other parts of, uh, around the United States. We have, if you look at our service area, uh, we have the 29th highest population in the United States compared to other transit systems service area. But we have the 13th highest ridership. So we're generating more ridership. We're offering more uh, mobility to more people compared to the number of people we have within that, our region. Weekday ridership is higher than that of Seattle and Denver, both of which are larger than Portland. And services delivered cost effectively. For example, example our operating cost, and I think this is for light rail actually, uh, is about half that of peer systems in Baltimore, Dallas, and San Jose, and still above many of the other ones beyond those. And a quick um, set of numbers that kind of t start to tell the story. This is an eight to 10 year period where Population grew 24%. Vehicle miles traveled, this is the U.S. They, it grows faster than the population. You know, we're now, I think uh, I saw 
we're now at the point where people, there are more cars than licensed drivers in the United States, and that's just the way things are. But despite that, TriMet ridership is growing faster than the rest of those growth curves. So we're catching up. And I already mentioned develop amount, um, around light rail. That's not just the round. That's not just Lloyd Center. That's downtown. That's all, along the entire length. Transit-oriented development, tr really trying to take advantage of that accessibility and that mobility and build ways, build in ways that allow people to connect. And so we have a number of indicators that can kind of show that uh, there are a lot of successes so far. Uh, Class A office space along the alignment has tripled since 1980. Downtown Portland employment is up 73% since the downtown plan was adopted. That's not since the, the light rail actually opened. 46% approximately of work trips to downtown are on transit. And um, if you think about that, you know, you'd, you'd almost have to, you'd have to increase traffic by that much if we didn't have the transit offering that service. And downtown just couldn't be this kind of a place where, that it is today. It's also carrying a major load. It's not, it's not, it's not even 50% of our total ridership, but it's a serious part of our, our total system. So 27% of the peak hour trips in the sunset in the Banfield are on light rail. And 77% um, of the trips that are being made are made by people who have auto options. It's not like the people who you see on the bus and on the light rail don't have any other options. They're choosing to do that because they're trying to avoid congestion or they have other needs that can't be served with what they're looking at. And this is a couple of years ago now. Money Magazine rated Portland number one, mentioning that the superb light rail network and a new streetcar system are, are helping to make it a cinch to get around. Everything's perfectly rosy and great, and, and it's a wonderful place to be, but there are lots of demands and, and lots of challenges for the future. Um, even with the additional service that we have with the red line and moving back and forth uh, now to Beaverton, which we just opened up, we still have demand. We still have times when it looks like this, and, and uh, demand is both a, uh, a reaffirmation of what we think is a pretty good job that we're doing and also a challenge to continue to extend. And looking at not just uh, increasing service in where we have it today, but looking at how to better serve all the different kinds of trips that happen around the region. And so current projects, things that are actually out there either in construction or far enough along in planning that we're pretty confident about where, where things are going and how things are going to end up looking. Interstate Max, of course, uh, if you've been out there, we're essentially done with construction. Uh, we're still stringing um, the overhead catenary system, that is the power system at the far north end, but we've already done some test runs and we'll be starting to do more in the new year and planning to open in May of 2004. So just over six months from today. And seeing, obviously, there are direct benefits. There are also indirect benefits that we've already seen. Um, Interstate Max is a different kind of place, or Interstate is a different kind of place than it was than when we started. And if you're traveling up and down there, you're starting to see we're getting some of the landscaping in, or we're, we're getting those art projects in there. It's a very small part of our project in terms of cost, but it's an important part of the comfort and um, sort of the effectiveness of the, the project so that it's truly cost effective, but it's still a special project and, and reflects the neighborhood somewhat. So there are some great art fixtures. You can see it at Rose Quarter already, the, the silicon forest, um, the little forest things that light up and are, are solar powered. And all of the stations have some sort of, of art to reflect something about the history and the feeling of those stations. We also uh, are trying to learn from each project, and I think we, we did a really great job with this, if uh, I'm going to toot our own horn here, in terms of business support. Interstate Avenue, um, there were businesses along there. There continue to be businesses along there. They weren't doing wonderfully well, and so a construction project can be a real impact on that. And we were able to work with them and really reduce the impacts and help people work through and, and really hope that now that construction is done and, and the new access and mobility are starting to come up, that that will be a, a truly positive change for the folks who are already on interstate and attract new economic development there. Portland Streetcar, um, right here downtown, right over by the Urban Center, opened in 2001, and actually there was a groundbreaking for the extension uh, down to uh, River Place. 
this year, and so we're looking at the construction down there. Obviously, that's not purely a TriMet project, but we are involved in doing the operations. And they, um, I mentioned kind of learning from our process over time. We learned something from them, too, which is you can really do a low-impact construction process. And they, they really tried to emphasize that with the existing um, line that opened in, in 2001. This is a shot, I think, out in northwest Portland showing that, yes, it cuts into the street, and yes, there are construction impacts, but it's, it's just, it leaves trees. It, it allows um, autos to go through there most of the time. So it's really quick, cost-effective, and minimizes the impacts so that you can get to the project and get to the benefits quickly. Uh, this is not under construction, but is it, we're trying to get into fe final design with the FTA. This is the Washington County commuter rail. And that connects way up the top from Beaverton Transit Center through next to Washington Square, through Tiger Tualatin, and down to Wilsonville. It's just under 15 miles and uh, offer, would offer a weekday peak hour service. And as I mentioned, we're working with FTA right now to, get, to try to get into the next stage. So that's sort of the segue into the future. What are the real future projects that aren't quite to final design? Again, always going back to the growth concept. How do you connect centers? How do you provide that mobility within the urban growth boundary so that we don't have to take over everything outside of the urban growth boundary? The regional transportation plan, which is a regional plan um, headed up by Metro, but everybody gets involved in it, really tries to take a 20-year look at how we get towards that. And then TriMet has transit investment plan, which is a five-year look at what are we doing over the next five years to improve service, to expand service where it's possible, to uh, look at all the other different th kinds of things we need to do to be heading in the right direction. And in that transit investment plan, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about light rail because that's what I do now. I talk about streetcar because that's what I know about. Uh, but it's not just that. It's, it, yes, it's rail. But also uh, looking at, in the future, high-capacity bus, which is sort of the next stage of development of bus services and how you extend those to fill in the system. Uh, frequent bus, which we've found some real successes on in the last few years, that is the every 15 minutes, all day, seven days a week. And those services, uh, when we add service in the middle of the day, have done extremely well and really helped to flesh out the system and provide mobility to a lot. Uh, a number of more people. And obviously local service is always a component. Uh, that will always be every kind of our, every piece of our service provides local service. Next step, um, something that's keeping us, uh, well, keeping me awake at nights, um, South Corridor. And to take kind of a half step back to look at what's happened this year in terms of, of moving towards this. We were looking at the South Quarter, that is from downtown, sort of everything to the south and southeast, all the way out as far as Oregon City and Damascus and that whole area, and worked through a number of alternatives over a number of years and ended up choosing what you're seeing up here, the schematic that you're seeing up here. Uh, running across is the east-west in blue line, the red line, the airport line, then the new green line, and that's the next stage. That's I-205 light rail. Uh, between Clackamas Town Center and Gateway and then coming in on the Banfield into downtown and running up and down on the Transit Mall in downtown Portland. That's what you see up here green, in green labeled as Phase 1. And then in Phase 2, separate project a little far, farther down the line, extending out to Milwaukee and continuing to improve that system and, and create more mobility for the, for the whole region. I-205, real quickly... This is, a, again, a schematic of what the project looks like. Uh, about six and a half miles from Gateway down to Clackamas Town Center, eight stations, about a 15 to probably 16-minute trip. With park and ride spaces along there, you can see how some of the, them are labeled, to provide some more of that access to the rest of the southeast. The mall alignment, um, this shows... Up at, uh, on your right side is to the north, so that's the steel bridge right on the edge. The uh, light rail coming down and going up towards Union Station and then running the full length of 5th and 6th, including down here by PSU with a station at the Urban Center and a station in between um, Hall and College Street. And then again, the next step, farther out, 
what, what, we're, what we're keeping on our radar screen but not quite working on in, in too much detail now is Milwaukee. And that crosses the, the uh, Willamette from downtown and then heads down generally parallel with um, McLaughlin to get to downtown Milwaukee. And even more, obviously this isn't a five-year plan. This isn't even maybe a 20-year plan. This is really looking out as far as we possibly can to try and understand what some of the options are out there. But the I-5 Transportation and Trade Partnership, which uh, finished up this past summer, uh, looked at options including light rail for tra enhanced transportation between Oregon and Washington, looked at options for crossing the Columbia, uh, both at uh, I-5 and at I-205. And we, in, in support of um, ODOT and WashDOT's efforts, TriMet helped develop some concepts for light rail along there. We know in the next year or two there will be another stage where we look again more focused in the I-5 um, alignment right along the river crossing to look at how to enhance freight traffic and general purpose traffic and transit accessibility across there. And then back to streetcar. I already talked about the, the groundbreaking that's uh, happened to extend down to River Place, but I think you've probably seen in the, in the uh, media that they're looking at the extension farther down into what's now called South Waterfront, uh, the region formerly known, or the area formerly known as North McAdam. Um, and this is just a concept plan with uh, just to the north, uh, sort of the, the I-405 loop, the, the Markham Bridge at the top, and that area colored in being the, uh, the South Waterfront area with the blue, a concept alignment for extending down into there and hooking up with the tram, of course, which I really won't talk about at this point. Um, and then looking further, well, we're taking baby steps, but there's an obvious connection farther south down to Lake Oswego along the alignment that's already there and making that connection. This is all concept. It's all pretty far out there, but they're all things that are kind of on the radar screen. And we did in the past year do a project with the city of, of uh, Lake Oswego to look at potentials for transit centers. and really came out with a better definition of the technical needs for how that might work, but also what the city's plans and needs and desires are for how you integrate that with their downtown development. And again, uh, not just as a token, but because it really does matter, we're just still figuring out how it works, is what we're calling as a placeholder high-capacity bus. How do you take advantage of buses' flexibility and low cost to provide service in places where rail or other options just don't necessarily make sense or are so far out there that we can't provide the mobility. And one more planning um, project that, we're, that we've just wrapped up and are looking at uh, the second phase in the next year or two, Powell Foster. And this is that red triangle kind of pointing out towards the area where the UGB was just expanded, uh, Happy Valley, Pleasant Valley, Damascus. As that begins to grow, how do you provide service out there, and uh, by service I mean transit, buses, rail, who knows, um, but even urban services, uh, new road connections, highways, how do you start to develop an urban form out there in something that's really just um, rolling hills right now? All of this, again, coming back towards a, this is just a cartoon of what a future system might be. This isn't really a plan, it's a concept. Uh, but all of these in service of looking towards the future for that. And that really was a whirlwind tour. What I'm going to do now is uh, pass over to Mark, and we're going to get a little bit into more detail of some of the, uh, the analysis work that we've done in the past uh, year or plus. Actually, it's been longer than that. Um, to understand some of the issues about our system and how things work as we transition from what used to be a rail line with a lot of buses and become more and more of a system. You see that um, when TriMet took over from Rose City back in 1969, it was a system that had really grown organically. Uh, it had just tried to meet needs, and there hadn't been a lot of uh, really strategic work on doing that. Over time, we've looked at re resizing, reshaping, optimizing the system, making mobility, uh, increasing mobility where we can, increasing options where we can, 
and getting things through, uh, just getting the system up and running and creating a true system. And so as we look towards these new projects, we need to understand how those systems work, especially at some of the, the crux points. All right. Yes, that's right. Former MERP of 2001, and glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I'll be coming, uh, be covering uh, just analysis of downtown light rail operations uh, during the South Corridor uh, study process. Um, the basic outline that I'll be covering uh, this uh, purpose and need for the study, and also the uh, FTA requirements that led us to do the study downtown. Uh, kind of a, an overview of our initial understanding of the system, uh, alternatives that were tested, uh, just an overview of modeling actually downtown core, uh, and the capacity implications and a couple different uh, concepts of capacity that we'll cover. Uh, some next steps and thoughts on conclusions, and then we'll open it up for a little question and answer session at the end. So purpose and need, uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, we have had a uh, uh, growth of light rail service uh, from the beginning of East Side Max in 86, uh, again adding West Side Max in 98, airport in 01, and uh, future demand in the downtown core with Interstate Max opening uh, in spring of next year, and also the additional lines that Alan mentioned that are now in the planning phase, uh, the Interstate 205 alignment and the Milwaukee light rail alignment that will be converging in the downtown. <clears throat> and also we needed to consider uh, the downtown stakeholders, of course, uh, considering our transit patrons, uh, pedestrians, uh, general purpose traffic, and also the needs and hopes of the business community. And also to uh, uh, satisfy uh, inquiries from the FTA uh, that uh, came out of the South Corridor study. And so why analyze downtown specifically? Well, again, um, there is a definite need with uh, future lines in the planning phases to understand uh, the system capacity <clears throat> on the existing alignment and also to identify uh, moderate cost fixes for capacity improvements and also to inform uh, the discussions that have been generated about the need for a second or alternate alignment in downtown. And also, again, the public business, public and business interests in uh, who are hoping for a service to the heart of downtown, and how also to include uh, growing Portland State University and the emerging South Waterfront District. <clears throat> and so, a lot of our work uh, really was integrated with the South Corridor study, beginning with the supplemental draft of the environmental impact statement, which evaluated alignments uh, for three. Uh, downtown light rail alternatives. And uh, as a part of this, we also uh, completed a downtown light rail systems analysis uh, that kind of was in conjunction with the South Corridor study. And the systems analysis report uh, really provides a technical information base for furthering our uh, downtown Portland light rail discussion and uh, overall understanding of the system and how it works. And so the first steps, of course, uh, working with our jurisdictional partners at the city of Portland and Metro uh, to brainstorm options for uh, increasing uh, the capacity in downtown on the existing alignment. And some things we had considered uh, were maybe signal preemption at uh, select intersections, uh, possible uh, change to the signal timing in the downtown, and also possible uh, changes to station locations. And so we, we chose uh, vSIM as the analysis tool, vSIM software that uh, provides a, uh, a wider scope and lots of flexibility in testing the various scenarios that we were interested in. And it also it analyzes traffic and transit operations under constraints such as lane configuration, uh, traffic composition, and so on, which a lot of the issues that we're up against in downtown. <clears throat> and so our initial understanding of capacity kind of before our VSIM analysis, um, <clears throat> the chart kind of shows uh, uh, different uh, uh, statuses of what we uh, assumed were going to be in effect as far as uh, uh, train volumes on the Morrison-Yam Hill alignment downtown. 
where we are today at 20 or fewer trains per hour. Uh, we assume that the impact would be pretty minimal on service quality, that the uh, spacing between each train would really provide resili resiliency and uh, wouldn't cause too many problems at 20 or fewer trains per hour. And then the next uh, category, uh, kind of a transitional flow that we were defining as a uh, 21 through 30 trains plus per hour uh, scenarios. <clears throat> and the impact, uh, we knew that we would likely be approaching the capacity ceiling and that resiliency likely would uh, gradually decline. And <clears throat> uh, the third category that we didn't quite know uh, exactly what would uh, come of it, but we thought we would be able to uh, get to a 30 to 40 trains per hour scenario on the existing alignment. And uh, we thought that it would be close to or beyond the ceiling of capacity, but that uh, possibly some simple mitigations would uh, allow that, uh, would allow 30 to 40 trains per hour. But uh, after the analysis, we know better now. And um, so quickly, I'll cover uh, again some of this, the, uh, the three scenarios and alternatives that we uh, studied. Uh, the Milwaukee light rail option that would uh, uh, have 22 trains per hour on the existing alignment up from today at about 14 trains per hour. Uh, the second alternative was a combined light rail option uh, with uh, Milwaukee and Interstate 205 uh, converging on the existing uh, Morrison Yen Yem Hill alignment, which would be about 25 trains per hour. And the third scenario, uh, the I-205 alignment by itself, which would uh, total 33 trains per hour on the existing Morrison Yam Hill alignment. <clears throat> and so some of the, uh, the different alternatives that we had applied to each of those three scenarios, uh, possible station respacing uh, configurations in the downtown by possibly uh, closing some stations, opening on at different blocks, we thought that uh, that could provide some uh, resili resiliency or capacity increases. A, uh, an alter alternative that would have um, an all green signal cycle, uh, that is uh, an all east-west signals would be green at once, followed by all north-south north signals uh, green at once, um, in contrast to in, in how it is today. Uh, signal priority again at select intersections. Uh, a modified operating procedure, i.e. A, a closer following scenario, uh, where uh, that would be that would differ from today, where uh, standard standard operating procedures uh, say that uh, a train say there's two trains at uh, a station next to each other, uh, the rear train is unable to move forward until the next train is has cleared the station. So uh, we thought that uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, loosening up those procedures might uh, provide a little more capacity. And then also a, uh, an actual uh, change to the signal timing in downtown from the current 60-second cycle to a 54-second cycle. <clears throat> and so in our search for a solution, we had uh, much internal discussion and interest uh, on the topics at hand and also, uh, of course, our study requirements from the Federal Transit Administration. <clears throat> and we also looked to uh, peer agencies to see how they were uh, dealing with some of these issues and if they, in fact, were or not. And it turned out that uh, out of Dallas, San Diego, Baltimore, and Calgary, uh, Calgary was really looking at some of the same issues that we were. So uh, we were able to get some information from them. <clears throat> and so the study approach, um, beginning with uh, Interstate Max opening day, uh, the 2020 uh, Milwaukee train volumes, and 2020 I-205, and the combined options uh, we built all those models in the vSIM software and then applied the different uh, alternatives, as, as, as I mentioned, the uh, downtown station respacing, the all green, et cetera. And our goal was to identify one technically feasible alternative for each scenario. And so uh, that leads to actually modeling the downtown Portland core. Um, <clears throat> in the vSIM model, we have uh, pretty much all of the downtown street network and crosswalks, all of the uh, light rail routes in downtown uh, existing and planned on their actual PM peak schedules. 
uh, over 50 bus routes in downtown on their PM peak schedules, and also a dynamic traffic assignment that was uh, uh, allowed us to assess uh, network performance for general purpose traffic in the PM peak, <clears throat> and also a, uh, a downtown mobility index for traffic uh, that I'll cover here in a couple minutes. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, the, the transit routes are on their PM peak schedules because that was really the the heart of our analysis was the PM peak. <clears throat> and so here's uh, just a quick screen capture of the vSIM software, the downtown model. Uh, as you can see, pretty much the entire grid is present. Um, the only thing that's off the, the picture up in the left, upper right-hand corner is the Rose Quarter area where we have that modeled as well. But uh, you can see the steel bridge coming over to um, the uh, First Avenue alignment and then the uh, the east side, or west side rather, alignment going off to the left here. So I'll just add while you keep that up there. We're, I don't think we have the right um, computer to actually run VSIM, unfortunately, but you'll see some screen captures from what this actually does. Um, it's, it's a micro simulation model that, you know, this is the background, and then you set it up to run for however many hours you need it to run with all the details of. of um, vehicles and transit and pedestrians and signal timing and all those other kinds of things that impact traffic and let it run and actually get to see in a very, very complex system what the impacts of each of these alternatives are and what, what really happens in a, in a regular scenario even without any of these alternatives added on. And so I, I mentioned uh, the downtown mobility index. Uh, they're kind of tough to, to see here, but we have uh, four different routes uh, for um, where we had sent uh, individual vehicles up uh, kind of the portals in downtown to just kind of get a sense of the impacts to uh, traffic in the downtown core. <clears throat> and so here is another screen capture of the VSIM model, and uh, hopefully this will run here. Uh, but uh, this is a close-in view of 5th and 6th, uh, the Morris and Yamhill alignments there. And uh, I believe this is a scenario that includes uh, Interstate Max on the uh, Morris and Ham Yamhill alignment. You can kind of make out a yellow train there on the blue alignment. Oops, wait, let me go back. Did this while we were did it there. before. There it goes. So it's, uh, you can see all the buses on 5th and 6th, and uh, the trains moving up and down more than the M Hill. But the, the simulation allows, uh, you know, a three hour simulation to take place over the course of about 15 minutes. So um, once, once the model is set up and the different scenarios are set up, uh, actually running the model takes about, you know, 15 minutes to a half hour or so. Um, <clears throat> moving right along. Uh, some of the general findings. Um, as far as capacity, uh, the signal progression in downtown really defines uh, the capacity for uh, light rail trains. Um, <clears throat> and so imagine, if you will, we are on a uh, on Morrison and uh, at zero seconds, at, and these are each different intersections. So at one intersection you have green light, uh, the next intersection is red, the next is red, and the next green, the next green, the next red, and the next red, and so on. So this begins the uh, signal progression in downtown on the current alignment at zero seconds. So these are the various intersections where we have uh, the different phases present. And if you are in a vehicle and uh, moving down the, uh, the street, at 15 seconds, the progression begins to happen. So um, as we can see, the, the, the first signals are still green, but the one that had been red is now green. And the progression happens as such. And at 30 seconds, uh, the progression continues and at 45 as well. So then you can see the green band building up and the red band building up at uh, the various intersections. 
And so what happens when you add light rail to the mix um, uh, <clears throat> with the same scenario in place and a four block station spacing, uh, zero seconds, we have two trains at respective stations. <clears throat> and uh, it should be clear. And at, at 15 seconds, the progression begins uh, with the, uh, the second signal becoming red. Uh, although the, the trains are still held at their red signals. Um, <clears throat> at 30 seconds, uh, both trains at both stations uh, have their green lights and they're ready to go, except that, uh, again, our operating procedures call for uh, the, uh, the rear train is unable to move forward until the front train has cleared the station. So at 45 seconds, we see that happening. The front train is uh, clearing the station. Uh, and the, the rear train is moving forward in the progression. At one minute, it's uh, moving forward to the next station. And in the next slide, we see, again, at one minute uh, at the top, it's moving towards the next station. At uh, 75 seconds, it's still within the progression and moving towards uh, the station. <clears throat> at 90 seconds, it's actually arrived at the station. It's performing as well. It's serving its passengers. <clears throat> and um, while it's at the station, the, the light turns uh, red again, so it's, it's there for another uh, entire phase. So uh, essentially, it's, it's a, a two-minute operation to uh, move one train from one station to another, which is really uh, uh, it limits the, the capacity overall. Um, <clears throat> And so this was a concept that really took a while for us to sink in, but uh, uh, that's really how the system works. Uh, it's a progression that uh, really sets a precedent. And with one train uh, for every two minutes, uh, it's a real limitation. Um, so that's Signals 101. Uh, preliminary results from the alternatives that we tested uh, for the different uh, <coughs> Scenarios again. I mentioned uh, the station respacing configurations. We uh, tested a couple different uh, uh, station respacing configurations that uh, added to uh, the resiliency and flexibility of the system, but it really did not raise the uh, capacity ceiling. Uh, the all green scenario kind of uh, fell by the wayside with uh, the city of Portland's concerns about uh, uh, possible lead foot drivers in downtown. Uh, taking advantage of a series of green lights and uh, just too many safety concerns there. Uh, signal priority at uh, select intersections uh, did not add to operable capacity uh, and uh, recent uh, Calgary results, I mentioned that before, uh, showed that uh, a fixed cycle time was better for light rail and uh, less disruptive to other traffic. And uh, the modified operations, the closer following scheme, uh, really carried too many potential operational and safety hazards and also potential for uh, a train getting caught in between stations and blocking an intersection. Uh, the, uh, and the signal timing was uh, uh, basically the main alternative added to the capacity ceiling, uh, though it did not guarantee consistent uh, service quality. <clears throat> and so again on that note, uh, the signal timing change really gave the most promising results. Uh, again, I mentioned that uh, the Interstate 205 alternative would have uh, 33 trains on the morrison Yam Hill uh, alignment, and the signal timing change to 54 seconds allowed uh, that many trains to uh, make it through the system. Um, <clears throat> and so you can also see here that existing conditions right now is about 13 to 14 trains per hour with a travel time of uh, 13 minutes. Uh, the Interstate 205 base uh, <clears throat> with, uh, that brought 33 trains to the system without any changes um, was uh, quite a, a massive travel time of about 23 minutes there. But the uh, signal timing change really uh, got us uh, beyond the capacity ceiling as we had defined it. <clears throat> So some general conclusions, uh, the bottom line, uh, capacity is not absolute uh, because we did find ways to increase capacity 
and we also found ways to improve, improve reliability. And there really is no sec single uh, technically correct number that describes the capacity limit, but travel time impacts, uh, reliability issues, etc., gradually build up. And without making any changes to the system, there does appear to be a ceiling of 30 trains per hour on the Morrison Yamhill couplet. And uh, we also uh, realize that the impacts to pedestrians and traffic can be serious uh, depending on the alternative. And also that uh, in general, the Rose Quarter area and Steel Bridge really need uh, some additional analysis. <clears throat> and so now I'll cover the concept of operable capacity as opposed to capacity ceiling. Uh, this chart shows uh, uh, a series of uh, alternatives that we had run. Um, let's see, I got my cheat sheet. Um, we had run a, a set of scenarios uh, from 21 to 30 trains per hour, and the results are shown here in the graph. And what we thought we'd see uh, in going through this process was uh, really drastic increases in. Uh, in travel times, and we, we do start to see that here with some uh, definite jumps between uh, uh, 24 and 25 trains per hour. We've got about a two minute uh, travel time jump uh, from Rose Quarter to the 11th Avenue turnaround. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so, as, as the, the hourly train volumes were bumped up, the travel times increased, uh, but the, really the main point. Is here is that uh, uh, once we got beyond 27 trains per hour, uh, we were getting one fewer train through the system than, one, that, than what was scheduled, <clears throat> and which really points to schedule and reliability. So that was really the main, uh, one of the primary findings uh, in addition to the increases here in travel times. <clears throat> and uh, also a similar chart here for Eastbound travel times, uh, 11th Avenue to Rose Quarter, with uh, really a gradual buildup in travel times. But again, we're getting uh, one fewer train through the system than scheduled. <clears throat> and overall, we, we kind of uh, proved to ourselves an industry rule of thumb that uh, operable capacity is generally 80% of the capacity ceiling, and uh, that uh, Overall, as far as our customers are concerned, schedule reliability really is paramount. And uh, this general rule of thumb in many ways seemed to be applicable in, it, in our case. And uh, so what's next? Um, well, the next steps really include uh, what we're doing now. It's studying uh, different uh, scenarios for light rail on the transit mall on 5th and 6th Avenue. And uh, that uh, has led us to complete the downtown amendment to the SDEIS, uh, which was published uh, last month. And the comment period is still open uh, through mid-November. Uh, and the locally preferred alternative for a second alignment in downtown Portland is up for metro consideration in January. And also, as I mentioned, uh, uh, next steps, uh, further analysis of Rose Quarter and Steel Bridge. <coughs> And so just a, a quick overview of uh, transit mall concepts. Uh, first being the left side platform. Uh, the next is a shared left uh, concept. Uh, third being an island platform. And fourth is a, a wide right platform. Uh, but really the primary consideration for us uh, in looking at these different concepts is how uh, light rail and bus interact with each other and with general purpose traffic. And so um, here we have just a quick uh, view of each of the four options under study. And if you will, imagine that we are on uh, uh, Fifth Avenue between uh, uh, Stark and Washington. So the, the left side platform would have the, uh, the light rail station on the left side, uh, where currently there is uh, quite a wide sidewalk there between uh, Stark and Washington. Uh, the shared left would have a uh, an auto lane that would be a part of that uh, wide sidewalk with the uh, station uh, next to the auto lane with uh, um, uh, lots of enhancements for pedestrian crossings from 
the station to uh, the sidewalk area. Uh, the island platform has the light rail station in the middle of the the, the roadway basically with uh, an auto lane on the left and transit are kept together, uh, light rail and bus are kept together on the right. And then uh, wide right, the wide right scenario which is uh, essentially the opposite of the left side and that would also allow uh, general purpose traffic to uh, traverse the station blocks. <clears throat> and so here we have another uh, quick snapshot of this is the uh, just the basic uh, left side platform uh, with light rail on the transit mall. And we'll see if uh, this thing wants to run at all. Try putting it on a piece of paper. Oh, yeah. So here we have the buses again running up and down 5th and 6th Avenue, but also, as you can see, uh, Interstate Max trains running up and down. It's kind of moving rather quickly, but. And also, we have the uh, Interstate 205 Green Line trains on the transit mall as well. So lots happening in, uh, and lots to consider. And, uh, right. and so next steps, further analysis. I uh, mentioned uh, the Rose Quarter will be working uh, with uh, our consultants to study the capacity of Rose Quarter for uh, light rail and general purpose traffic as we add uh, these additional lines and also the steel bridge as it is the main river crossing for all of the existing and planned light rail lines. <clears throat> and so in closing, uh, we're definitely still learning uh, about our system and about vSIM. And uh, we're also learning about uh, vSIM data outputs. Uh, originally when we started with vSIM, we had a tendency to think that <coughs> Uh, something was wrong with the way we were setting up the model or um, we weren't uh, quite getting the, all the model aspects correctly, but uh, um, the, uh, the, the uh, VSIM data outputs really, uh, in most cases, really uh, tell a story. And uh, the software will definitely continue to provide insight into our existing and future system and there's uh, much more to come on this front. And so on that note, we'll open it up to questions. If there are any. Good, okay, let's go. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about the uh, <coughs> procedures uh, for the max trains not leaving a station until the next station has been cleared. Yeah. And this is in downtown where we're in line of sight. Um, I'll let you finish your question just a minute, I swear. Uh, but out, outside of downtown, we're, we're governed by a railroad signal system. So you have to follow, obey those signals. And it keeps a lot of separation between trains. In downtown, we're under what's called line of sight, which means you just got to leave enough clearance for the train ahead of you. Sorry, go ahead. Well, it's sort of a. Um, you know, people who know the railroad system maybe know what you're talking about, but uh, the, uh, in the, I know some cities where they have light rail in Europe where the, the, the trains aren't two trains, there's one. We have, we have two basic cars in our light rail. Mm -hmm. And so they have their stations are much larger than ours, and they, they, they pack in the light rail where one rolls in, another one rolls in behind, and a third one behind. And so they have three actual trains stopping at one station at a time. And so they must have some procedure that, that controls these, you know, because it's just like traffic. Two car, three cars pull up to a stop. There's a chance that one will rear, rear end the other. So I'm wondering if you have studied any other cities where their trains actually uh, drive that, you know, ride, yeah. go that close together. And two, um, have, since the stations are, are more than one block apart, have, have you considered having the, uh, the rule be you can't leave your block face until the, the block face in front of you is clear, such as in downtown, the, the station's pretty much the whole length of the block. You could have the next train just queued up right on the other side of the stoplight, so so you won't have to wait so long as the previous. That, that's a good question. Um, Europe has a couple of things that Portland doesn't. One is, um, if, at least where you saw it, they didn't have 200-foot blocks. Um, our blocks are just about as long as our trains are when we have a two-train or two-car consist which means that um, 
We can't, we can't afford to leave things. We can't have three cars. We can't have two, two trains stopping at the same station at the same time because they would literally overlap into the cross street. So we're constrained just by pure um, geometrics. We also, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this, perhaps we don't have quite as well educated, I don't know, um, riders. What we have had in the past is when, obviously, we try not to have um, trains get stuck in between stations, but sometimes it happens. And what happens sometimes is people will pull what we call the emergency mushroom. Um, there's this red thing that you pull to open the doors, and that slams the brakes on everything, and everything gets stuck. And what happens, apparently, is people think they're at a station and want to get out. And so we've had that happen often enough that we can't reliably plan to stop in between stations. You're saying that if a train stops <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. at the block before the station, you have yeah. a whole bunch of problems. With yeah, and, off. and uh, I would put this back up. Actually, if you if you try to, we, we thought we might get something out of this, and that's why we tested the closer spacing. And one of the things we found was that given the sort of rigid environment of downtown with the signal system the way it is, even if you do that, ignoring the safety problems, it actually doesn't increase the capacity because you still have to line them up somewhere. And you still, at any place where you stop, you really can't get more than one train every two minutes. And that starts to define, without changing the whole downtown grid, that starts to define what ha can happen downtown. That's a good question. Um, we'll keep looking at that as we go along. Doesn't, doesn't the, the suggestion that you now have discovered capacity constraints <coughs> in downtown, you know, you're trying to roll out interstate max, um, and that's going to cost probably, I don't know what the downtown mall line is going to cost, but it's gonna, not trivial. Doesn't that suggest that you, essentially you've lowballed the community in deciding how much interstate max is really going to cost trying to run that many extra trains through downtown, promising each one of the three legs on the east side uh, five minute service? Well, that's a reasonable question. Um, the, the answer is that if we stopped at interstate, we'd be okay. If we never built anything new and um, we just had general growth, it would last well beyond the 20 years. It would last, actually, I don't know, it would last longer than that. Um, the issue is if we continue to expand and add new lines, because you're exactly right. We're trying to we're trying to pull everything into one place because the majority uh, or a large enough percentage of people want to go downtown that we really need to pull our services into there when we're talking about this kind of high capacity. And so when we get to I-205 and we get to you know possible extensions across the Clark County and we talk about other extensions in other directions, you do start to need to talk about a second alignment or an alternative alignment downtown. So then shouldn't those extra costs then be apportioned to the south corridor or the next line? Well, that's exactly what we're doing with I-205, where I-205, <coughs> when we're extending that, that starts to move us towards those upper ends where you start to find um, uh, reduction in, or increase in travel time reduction in reliability. And so it's it's part of that project. They're, they're one in terms of, of uh, put, pulling together funding and applying to the FDA for how this works. Yeah. So is 205 going downtown then? I guess that's the... Yeah, uh, the concept, at least, the question was, is 205 going downtown? The, the concept is, uh, I'm not even going to try to go back to it, but that it's a single green line, just like we have the red line and the blue line today. It would be the green line, and you could get on um, at Clackamas Town Center and ride all the way around along the band field and down into downtown to out to PSU. So is that 33 trains then on the steel bridge? No, what the scenarios that we were analyzing, I mean, this was, a, this was kind of a story about what we were analyzing in the past. Um, it's, it's not exactly 33 trains. That was if it was I-205 only, with no eventual expansion to Milwaukee, and in the scenario that we were talking about at that time, we're trying to put everything on the cross mall. And that's where it gets back to, if we're not talking about that second alignment, we start to run into problems with I-205. Why are you seeing um, in your simulations such a big drop up in or increase in travel time going west than to east? Is that loading, or is it? Um, I, I think, and I'd want to dig more into the details before 
I give you a definitive answer, but what I think what happens is um, some of it is variation between uh, runs because literally it's such a complex system that every time we run it, you get slightly different answers because it's trying to model actual behavior. Uh, but also it's, it de it's determined by, um, in the system we built, the cross mall from first to 11th about is the real constraining factor. That's what really defines the, the, the capacity. And so which direction you're running heading into there, you capture more or less numbers of trains, which means that you capture more or less of that impact of that capacity. And so, for instance, when we had 33 trains going through the system and the travel time shot up, what we really had was 30 trains getting through the system and three literally just lining up and not going anywhere. And so that, that, that um, travel time shot up because of the averages across the whole thing. Um, an interesting thing about anybody who does modeling, if you just looked at the cross mall itself and ignored all the stuff that was lining up, the cross mall was working great because it's the meter. It, it was the thing, once you go past the cross mall, they were running just like clockwork, exactly how you want it. It's the other side, and you run into that all the time. You, you find one location, you fix that location, and then something else pops up. Sorry, go ahead. When is TriMet going to start showing a subway as an alternative in these future plans. Every every presentation I go to with TriMet, we show new bridges across the Willamette, we show different alignments downtown, but never is there any future plan for a subway. Why not? Well, if you got an extra billion dollars, we'd be happy to name it after you. But, um, sorry. Well, Ser I get that seriously. answer every time, but I really am not confident that TriMet knows what the, what the, the number is. Have you ever done a serious pricing model of what a subway alternative would be, given all of these other costs that you're incurring. Yeah, that's a good, try that's a, that's a really good question. Capacity. Because that's exactly what we're talking about. It, when you get into downtown, if, it's, if it continues to be in the center, ultimately, um, if one alignment needs to be two, then you go 100 years or 50 years or whatever it is um, out if those two alignments need to be three, and when do you talk about going? Well, I'm somewhere? asking you. You're the capacity and planner. It doesn't sound like you're really well, taking I'm, that very I'm seriously. trying to get to the answer. Okay. Um, we're, we're 20 years along in a process if, where we have looked at that, and we're continuing to make sure that, that it's not the right thing to do next. Well, we had a 20-year slide, and there was no subway alignment shown in the 20-year vision. Right, and what we're showing is with this with the second alignment using some of the analysis that we've been talking about, you get 35 to, depending on how quickly all these other uh, uh, alignments get added, 60 years worth of capacity with those two. And the rule of thumb is that, you know, on the surface, if you go up to uh, some kind of elevated, it doubles the cost. If you go down, it, it triples or quadruples the cost. Now, we have, because you're asking exactly the right question, we have engaged a consultant to look at the cost and what the impacts and what the benefits of that would be. And we're doing that over the next six months or so. Okay. So you will share that with the public? Yeah. I don't know who's next. This is related to this question. I know on the uh, fourth or <coughs> fifth and sixth, the bus mall, there's numerous um, so-called vaulted sidewalks and various basement structures underneath the street. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the most significant being the new uh, mall connector <coughs> for the, uh, the Rouse Mall downtown. Right. Well, that, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is under Fort, um, between the Pioneer Place Oh, you're and right, Pioneer you're right, you're right. I believe you're right. But there are um, numerous heating ducts going under there as well. Are those structures, would you have to rebuild the structures in order to put in the light, so-called light rail, which is actually quite a heavy vehicle? That, that's a good question, too. Um, uh, the reason why that question comes up is if you go back before we built the transit mall, the sidewalks used to be 15 feet wide from, from those, uh, the wall of the building out to the edge. And the downtown buildings especially would build their, their uh, basement 
under that sidewalk, all the way out pretty much to that 15 foot long. And so one of the many, many things we're having to work through as we go through, as we try to enter preliminary engineering is, we've identified all those, we're making sure we understand what all the potential impacts are. The great thing is that none of them extend on the mall, at least, beyond that 15 foot line. And if you go back to our, our trying to understand and, and improve our construction techniques, you think about how the streetcar did it, <coughs> cut a pretty narrow swath and build there. That avoids the stuff on the sidewalks. And so the transit mall, pro the Portland Mall project um, would probably include or would include some kind of refurbishment of what's on there, but it's not you know, building to building, cut it out and rebuild it. Right, it's, but it's minimized that as there much. There were a lot, you notice, I think it's on fifth, that there's a lot of heating vents going, that that is the, uh, the ventilation systems are right out into the street mm. for a lot of the surrounding buildings. And presumably those have to maybe go up, be moved to some side streets, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, those, I'm, I'm not the right person to answer the details, okay. but we do have a um, basically utility <coughs> expert right. engineer who does that, who identifies all the utilities, not just not just HVAC, but um, water and sewer and you know, all that fiber optic that was laid a few years ago and everything else that's under there. And you identify what needs to be moved, what can be kept there, what can be protected, what needs to be adjusted. And that's, that's, that's an important part of the construction project. Yeah? It might be a little too early to answer this question, but um, have you thought at all about um, transit operations during construction? Yeah, we have. And we're still in the scratching our heads stage. Um, and all I can do is talk about issues, with, with no decisions. Um, we're going to try to obviously minimize the construction impact, both for to minimize the impacts on everybody around the street, but also to minimize the impacts on ourselves. But at some point, each segment of 5th and 6th will be closed for a short period. And so one of the questions is, do we just keep buses on the mall and reroute them around the few blocks that are impacted during that time? Do we move them completely to a different street? Do we take both of them off and move them to fourth or third or whatever? I mean, come up with your own scenario. Um, and we're, we're still really in the stages of identifying all the issues with each of these options and not really to the point where we've identified a great option. One thing I will mention is that uh, we think uh, once light rail is in place, whenever that happens, that there will be some reshuffling of, of buses because some will be optimally uh, able to provide service to some parts of downtown that don't have the best service. You can build in a little bit more of a grid perhaps or look at other alternatives. Still keeping the main focus of bus service on the mall, but using that as an opportunity to look at other options. And so if we identify things that are not on the mall, maybe on day one of construction you move those routes. So at least that that helps reduce some of the impact. Anything else? Well, I've, I've got several. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Who else? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, I wanted you to hear you defend why why you don't think in fact um, TriMet's attitude towards buses is strictly. I mean, you've said yeah, you say that again. You, well, you you stated you stated that. Primate's interest in, 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 in buses is more than a token interest. But everything, all the evidence that I've seen suggests, suggests otherwise. Um, in the, if you look at the number of, of bus routes in, uh, that are running through downtown, those are way down compared to the past. If you look at every time they expand light rail, they reduce and eliminate bus routes. They turn what, what are otherwise that direct downtown buses into feeders for light rail. Uh, if you look at um, uh, your list of projects for the future, although you talk about bus, bus rapid transit, there are no busway projects uh, that are on the table. And uh, now you're proposing to slice up the bus mall, which is the primary way that people actually get to downtown. If you look at that 46%, <coughs> that's largely bus customers. So in, in what sense, and, and moreover, you even call light rail cost effective when everything I've seen suggests numbers on the order of six times higher per passenger. So in what sense is the is TriMet's support of buses not just a token support. Well, I did mention the, the frequent service, which is part of um, our system as a whole. And, you know, 
light rail, this region has identified, China has identified, Metro has identified, as a great tool for certain jobs. But it's obviously, we can't run light rail everywhere. We wouldn't want to run light rail everywhere. And so buses aren't just filling in the gaps. They're creating the system. Uh, we, four years ago, I think, we only had three bus routes that ran 15-minute headways every day which is starting to get into the range where it's frequent enough that you can just walk out and catch one instead of having to check your schedule and then plan around that. We now have 14 route segments that do that. Different numbers going in each direction. Actually, if you look at, um, if you look at our new system map, you can see uh, we're doing a much better job of pointing those out. If you look at the brand new one, the thick lines are frequent service routes that you know, even if you walk out in the middle of the day on a Sunday, it'll still be coming every 15 minutes. Why would you want to do that on Sundays and Saturdays and off-peak hours? A lot of people do. Our ridership in the midday, actually, and on weekends, has been growing better than during the peak. And that's part of why we are a cost-effective system, because we're able to attract those kinds of rides that otherwise would, um, you know, maybe just be during the peak when it's the most expensive to provide services. So I think I answered maybe half of your question. <laughs> well, the, no, the other no, half no is busway projects. Right. The, the other half is we don't have a busway project right now. But it was considered and still definitely very much on the table for the Pal Foster corridor, which, which I mentioned. Uh -huh. uh, it was one of the options, though it was not um, followed up on for the main spine for Milwaukee. But it's certainly, it's actually part of the uh, locally preferred alternative to have BRT, bus rapid transit type improvements from Milwaukee down to Oregon City to make that connection. And um, if you go out and look at our bus system today, it's different in many ways than it used to be. You know, we have transit signal priority at over 200 intersections. We have, si we have uh, shelters, over a thousand shelters in the system where we used to have just a few hundred, it's not that long ago. And so we're trying to, it's not instant, but we're trying to, over time, improve the total transit system, buses, lift services, everything at the same time. That's about as well as I can do right now. Go ahead. I have a bus-related question. I was wondering how you decide, or what you take into account when you're looking at where you could add a new bus connection, because on the inner east side of Portland, there's a really good connection with downtown, but north-south. There's some lacking areas, particularly between MLK and Grand and 30, and 39, 40 seconds. There's like a line on each of those. There's about 35 blocks in between where there's no north-south connection between southeast and northeast Portland. And there's been a lot of activity and revitalization around the Alberta and Killingsworth area. I figured that you would want to connect that with some of the southeast stuff like Hawthorne and Belmont Division. But there's there's nothing in between. And 20th and 28th both have bridges across the freeway, which is the main barrier for north-south service. I'm wondering if anyone's ever looked at providing north-south service on the inner east side. Well, I could try to duck that by saying that we're capital projects planners and not service planners. But, um, <laughs> may, maybe, I can, maybe I can just mention a few things. One is that um, that idea has definitely come up, and it, and it, it still has legs in our system. Um, how you tie those together and then how you provide service to the people who are now expecting a direct ride into downtown and would have to change is something that we really struggled with when we reformed the system on the east side in the 80s. The reason we have a pretty good grid, except for in that 20th, 28th corridor, is because we really did reinvent what was going on with that system on the east side. And that proved to be a pretty tumultuous kind of process. We think that what we have today is a better system than we had. Uh, but it's, it's hard to get there. And it's really got to be grounded in a lot of analysis and understanding about what happens. It, I can't go much farther than that. But if you look, for instance, at the RTP and look at some of the routings on there, there is a route that looks somewhat like that. And um, we haven't committed to it because we haven't figured it out exactly how it works and how it fits in with the rest of the system. But it's something that is, you know, long term under consideration. Yeah. I just add that I think grid in Southeast Portland is a lot different than it is in Northeast Portland. I've lived in Southeast Portland for for uh, ten years. Ago. I travel a lot, but on bicycle, so slower. You know, uh, all the streets, and then now I'm in Northeast, and the roads 
the roads up there tend to lend themselves easier, I think, to buses like the 8 that goes up 15 times. Once um, you get south of the freeway, the residential uh, structure, kind of the streets are narrower and a lot of places, and I don't think they lend themselves as well through the Well, roads. in many ways, it's about how the urban form kind of developed over time that, yeah. um, you know, there's always been a radial aspect even to roads, not just the transit. And so north and northeast tends to point south towards downtown, and southeast tends to point west towards downtown. And so you get, just in terms of the number of streets that are out there as options to run service on and how the development came over time, that starts to define why we are where we are today. Yeah? Um, I don't know if you can answer, but as far as routing for the bike rail, has there been a thought to routing um, I, I come from the Bay Area, so we have like a kind of a point-to-point -point system where you can get from the end of one line to two of the other arms mm -hmm. and to kind of eliminate the transferring. I live on the west side, so if I want to go to the airport, I have to load up everything, you know, the kids, the car seats, and then transfer, right. you know, and do that whole thing. And you can't get to do the same thing if you're coming from the east side. And well, that, that's an easy one. We're, okay. <laughs> we, it, just this past September, we tried to, to take a little step towards that by extending the red line to airport service from downtown, where it used to end, all the way up to Beaverton. Mm -hmm. Now, that was done in some ways because there was more demand on the west side than the blue line could handle during the peak. Right. But it also starts to point in that direction. That kind of system is really um, a mature system. And I talked about earlier, you know, we were a line and we're turning into a system, but we're still turning into a system. And so if we get there is a separate question as to whether it's a good idea. Obviously, at least in some ways, it's a good idea, and it's something we'll continue to look at. But yeah, not, I, mean, I didn't know as far as scheduling, if you could, if there's some way of saying, okay, well, we're going to run one one every hour, say, from the end, so that we people who don't write all the time say, okay, I know it's leaving mm -hmm. on the hour from Hillsborough, so it should be here, you know, about so. Uh, not not to say no, but one of, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, the frequency of service is part of the product, is part of what we're actually providing. Um, if you can walk out your door and just go down to the local train station or the bus stop and not have to worry about the schedule, it's a very different experience than if you have to, you know, once an hour or whatever. Um, and so all things being equal, which they never are, but if they were, you try to shy away from that kind of, you know, once every hour or sort of odd service or A, B routes, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not saying we don't do it. There are, uh, there are places I can point to in our system where we do something like that. Um, but that's just one of the considerations mm -hmm. that's part of it. Mark, what were some of your stumbling blocks you ran into using vSIM? And how did you guys overcome that to come up with more reliable results? Um, <clears throat> well, I think some of the most, some of the major stumbling blocks were uh, setting up the signal system, and uh, which we had to look to our consultants quite a bit for. <clears throat> Really, uh, <laughs> that, that was one of the main things that was some of the most confusing stuff because we're not signal engineers, and um, in particular the the uh, priority <coughs> or signal priority. Uh, getting into some of that was uh, some of the most cumbersome, uh, but luckily we had some great help from our consultants at ITC. So, no, uh, not to sound like we're a commercial or anything, but um, the the software was really great. Um, but one of the challenges, um, when it crashed, all the warnings were in German. Yeah. <laughs> that so that we, was a bit of a stumbling block. <laughs> say Achtung something something. something. <laughs> we had to choose whether to beend it or to something else. <laughs> testing right now the hybrid diesel electric buses and I was wondering if you plan to um, to put those on any more routes in the near future uh, I'll tell you what I do know um, first the question was about hybrid buses the diesel electric buses um, we've got two of them they're very distinctive because they have that big white hump on the top <coughs> and we've been running them on the 17 
in a couple of other routes. We, we're actually already on the second generation for one of those. We got two of them a couple of years back, and we've been testing them out. And they were doing okay, but they weren't doing what we had hoped, which is really save on, on uh, fuel efficiency. Um, and they were quieter, but they weren't that much quieter. But we, we got the new generation, one of them, um, they put in a new power plant and new battery system, I think. And um, that one has been performing much better. More cost effectively? Yeah, it's, it's getting better uh, gas mileage. I don't know exactly the number, but I think it's on the range of 10% better, which when you're talking about you know four miles per gallon is, is a good increase. Now let's talk about the cost of um, Yeah, I, I was going to get to that. Um, so, and they're also quieter. So we do like them, but we haven't been able to make a commitment to them because right now the, the jump in cost between a regular and a hybrid is over $100,000. And so, you know, going back to kind of the, the being good stewards of public money, we, we can't leap to it until we're <coughs> sure, and somehow you can make a case that it, it's an overall resource savings. Yeah. I just had a question about the, the light rail vehicles. Is there a plan to retire the high floor LRVs? Um, not that I know of. Uh, the, the, the kind of industry standard is that they're good for decades and that at some point you do a major overhaul and then you keep running. So there are rail cars out there that have been running for 50 years or more. Heck, in San Francisco they've got some that have been running for 100. Um, Somebody, not me, I think, has some ideas about when that major overhaul happens and when the replacement cycle is, but it's way, way in the future. And one more question, yeah. unrelated to the vehicles, but to the light rail system. I mean, basically, we're talking about bottlenecks, and this is, you know, this is what I study in the transportation systems. And so you're taking a bottleneck on the cross uh, mall and eliminating it, but where are you moving it to? Is it the Rose Border or the Steel Bridge? Yeah, I think that's why we had that on there. Um, and, and the question is, how many decades did that buy us, yeah. and what are the issues there? And the, I know better what the issues are. Um, you've got the merge of the two lines. We've got a signal system that includes traffic operations. We've got a bridge that lifts occasionally, but more importantly, that we have to run slowly across. And then we've got another merge on the other side. And so that kind of system of elements is the kind of thing that's kind of hard to work through. And some tool like this is really helpful, uh, but it's also really complex. And so we're working through how to do that. When the North Interstate opens uh, in May, yeah. how many trains per hour will you run through downtown? And how are they divided amongst the three uh, stubs on the east side? Endpoints on the side. Um, I, I think. Interstate will add six yeah. trains. I, I believe that it's, um, <clears throat> well, five, it's five or six for interstate. It's definitely four for the airport max. And I believe we're running nine right now for the blue line. I was wondering what the plan is to extend bus service to the South Waterfront area. It seems <coughs> like there's going to be major properties that are going to be online here within a couple of years, and it's going to be another 10 years before Max services the area. So what's well, the short-term plan? That's really one. Wow. The real answer is um, that's not our department. <laughs> <laughs> I know the commitment remained. We made the commitment to run buses down there as soon as there's a straight. So the lines right. 35 and 36 would be diverted down there as soon as there's a straight to run on. Yeah, and did, then did you hear that? Comes. So there, there's a commitment to provide bus service. Um, when there's enough infrastructure, aka streets, mm -hmm. to offer that service and actual development down there to serve. Um, and there are lines that are already kind of blowing past there that can be rerouted into there. Um, but it's kind of a system of which of those routes go in and then how to streetcar supplement that service. There's somebody else in a different department who's, who knows a lot more than, than either of us do know about that. Um, there is uh, uh, the whole controversy about uh, uh, investment in trains, whether streetcar or uh, light rail. Uh, other than analyzing uh, you know, maybe ridership, is there any other ways that uh, you guys have been able to justify it? And, and 
on the ridership side, has there been any real true study, like maybe long term on the east side, or is there a planned one for the uh, I-5 corridor to look at bus ridership trends, you know, over time, and maybe if they're if they're skyrocketing, <coughs> or if they're just going along the same right. tra tra trajectory? Our our bus ridership has program? been well, our bus ridership in general has been growing, right. and especially like I was mentioning in the midday and, and weekends. Um, but after West Side, despite all those changes we made, bus ridership did increase overall. Even more? And, at a, what, what rate? That's, I guess, I, I, a I'm rate. not the right person to answer that, unfortunately. I know that it did. I know that it wasn't just that we took a bunch of people off buses and put them on the trains and then that was the end sum. We got a total system larger ridership on the west side between them, ignoring trans, I mean, leave, you know, separating <coughs> out transfers. But I, would, I would expect with the growth in the west side that you would, this percentage of total new growth, a certain percentage would be transit riders. So you're going to have some new growth. I'm not the right person to, to answer that because I just don't know the numbers well enough. And but are those um, uh, studies that TriMet will be doing or that um, I-5, for example, or have done long-term studies for Gresham? So are they are they out there? Future <laughs> seminar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to there. suggest future seminars. Well, I mean, we, we, we obviously capture the numbers over time of ridership of all of our individual buses. We even get to the point where this might be another future yeah. seminar of uh, knowing what's happening at each individual bus stop so that we can plan better and better over time. I guess the first part of my question was then, are there other ways to study that? Uh, because I'm sure that the, the total cost of building a light rail system can't be covered by a bunch of bus tickets. Are there other indicators that you can study to say that this light rail investment was worth the public expenditure? No, that's a good question. Is um, the, the, that or? The FTA is now requiring what's called a before and after study. And that is with any major transportation infrastructure improvement, well, transit infrastructure improvement, you do a study of ridership and um, other base elements to begin with before, before construction starts. And then once it's done, several years after, you look at ridership and those other things. And you compare across them, you understand how that matched with your projections, how what the benefits really were compared to how you were projecting, and exactly that kind of thing. How does it compare with overall growth and all those kinds of things? So that's I mean that's right where the industry is right now trying to understand, drill down as deep as possible to understand exactly what those benefits and costs were and how they trade off. So I, guess, I know in the I-5 corridor they're uh, trying to you know, improve the interstate and the, su the success of improving that will help uh, industry. And so the investments may not be uh, in saving money necessarily, gas mileage. It might be the businesses don't move out of port. Yep. Is there anything like that where they're saying, I think, we I think that's part of that. And therefore, we have more, uh, more investment. Or it's kind of a ranking picture. Right. Um, Is yes. Is there a study like that? Yeah, absolutely. But I can't I think go into it. I think I need to wrap up. <laughs> but that, yeah. Um, thank you for your great presentation and for your great questions. And before yeah. we thank our speakers officially, next week uh, Wayne Kittleson of Kittleson and Associates, the Wayne Kittleson, <laughs> will be uh, talking about a new Highway Capacity Manual Applications Guidebook that has just come out or is in the process of coming out. We'll be in our normal location in 204 uh, Urban Center, Distance Learning Center. Alan and Mark, thank you very much. <laughs>